Hello, everybody. This is a different kind of Jim Cornette experience today, and we've already started it once and didn't get this far. Um, it, we're not going to review any wrestling, and we're not going to talk about bullshit, and there's no commercials, and I don't actually know if we're going to finish this. At this point, I don't know if we're going to get anything that we can air. I would like to, because I truthfully want to get this over with. And I can't do another podcast in my life without talking about this. So the option was do this or never do another podcast again, which was heavily considered over the last couple of days, rather than do this. But we're going to try. Um, if you're listening to this, then you probably know that Bobby Eaton passed away this past Wednesday night. And... Obviously, everybody, as soon as they got the news, were on social media and et cetera, and a lot of people were paying tribute to him. But everybody knows that I have a hard time talking about stuff like this with about certain people, and so I wasn't sure exactly what we might do here today, and I'm still not. Um. And that's why Brian Last is here to try to keep me on some kind of coherent train of thought, Brian, which you've already lost that battle. Um, but what we're going to try to do, because the words that I just got out may have been the hardest, we're going to—I'm not going to say those again—but we're going to try to just talk today about Bobby and what he meant to everybody and some of the <laughs> cool things about him. And how much that he helped not only me, but a lot of people. And the, the respect that they had for him. And Brian, I'll let you talk in a minute, but obviously a lot of people are like, what happened? What happened? <clears throat> well, we already talked about on the shows here last month, Bobby's wife, Donna, passed away. She was Bill Dundee's daughter, and they'd obviously been married uh well they got married in what was it 1981 ish i i can't remember but anyway um and the story went out that they donna had always been forbidden to uh to date any wrestlers because she's the daughter of a wrestler and dundee knew what was going on and then he found out without finding out who it was just that she'd been behind his back. She'd been seeing one of the boys and she, he's like, Oh, I'm going to kill the motherfucker. And she says, Bobby Eaton. And he's, like, uh, well, all right. God damn it. If you had to pick one, you picked the right one. And so Donna had passed away. She'd had breast cancer, uh, before, and then it had come back and it had been, you know, she knew what was going on, um, but it was just last month, and then a few weeks later, and I don't think we've even talked about this on the show because I didn't want to alarm people, um, but Bobby had he'd gotten dizzy, fallen some kind of way at at his at his house in Nashville, uh, his daughter Taryn was moving over from North Carolina to uh, to live there so that she could monitor Bobby's medicines and you know the issues he's had. We everybody knows he's had so many health issues. He's had a couple of heart attacks. He had a pacemaker put in. He was diabetic. Um, I mean, honestly, like most of the boys. Uh, his age that have worked for so long, he'd been having issues back and forth with 
his memory and maybe, you know, it wasn't a serious situation, you know, all the time, but, you know, point is needed somebody to make sure he was taking his medicine, et cetera. Taryn was in the process of moving over. And I think she completed that. But anyway, they took him to the hospital because he fell and banged himself up and he was dizzy and they couldn't get him upright. So, um, they kept him for, I guess he was there for about 10 days because they were monitoring his various signs. Um, they even at, at one point they asked him what kind of pacemaker he had and he it, it might as well have asked him, you know, what battery they use on the challenger space shuttle. Right. He, I, I, you know, and they, I think they called the hospital over in Jonesboro where he'd got it. And, but at one point also they'd mentioned that they, uh, and I was getting this from, from Bobby told me a little bit on uh, times I talked to him, but his friend, Brian Thompson went over and saw him and, and got some of this information and I'm trying to relay it properly, but they had mentioned they might send him to a, from the hospital to a physical rehab center because of his hip. They were concerned about his hip in the fall, but I still, as, as we were thinking about it further. I don't know whether he injured his hip particularly in that fall or whether they just actually x-rayed Bobby Eaton and said, my God, how are, what's the matter here? How are you walking? We need to do something immediately. I don't know. Right. Um, but at any rate, then they decided to, uh, send him home and have a physical therapist come to his house. Uh, to work on his hip and et cetera. And they revamped his medicines and sent him home on Saturday afternoon. And I talked to him right as they were, he was like, well, Gordon, you're going to let me go home. I'm going to get off of here. Um, and he has been there with, you know, his daughter and I think grandson is there and people, you know, been, He's been on the medicine. People were around him. His physical therapist came on Wednesday afternoon and worked with him. And it was like, okay, you know. And then Wednesday night, something happened. So, you know, Brian, say something. Well, obviously, Jim, uh, I don't know how much of it you've seen. I know you've seen some of it, but the outpouring of support and love, the condolences coming in from all across professional wrestling, from fans, from people involved with wrestling companies, from wrestlers. You know, he was one of those guys, especially to a lot of the guys in the locker room of Crockett Promotions, the favorite wrestler of the wrestlers. You know, you hear Ric Flair or any of these guys talk about Bobby Eaton or working with Bobby Eaton, and it says a lot, but, you know, we're not just celebrating... Bobby Eaton, the wrestler, Bobby Eaton from the Midnight Express, we're celebrating Bobby Eaton, the person, and you got to, better than anyone, know every side of Bobby Eaton, you got to ride with him, you got to, when you were a photographer, you got to take pictures, and uh, I was actually going to ask you about that, because... First first time I ever went to court, I went with Bobby Eaton. I wasn't even in the business yet. What happened? I was a witness. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? So we're in Rupp Arena in Lexington, Kentucky. One night, it's 1981. And I'm shooting pictures. It's Bobby's in a match with somebody. I can't remember who is not pertinent to the fucking story, right? But Dream Machine's in the first family also. Jimmy Hart's first family. He's got to do a run-in on this match. So they're fucking, they're going into the finish and the shit's going on. Here comes Dream down the aisle hauling ass to do this run-in. And this big old fucking corn-fed farm boy in about the fourth row on the end, got a, saw Dream go by and jumped up and fucking waistlock tackled him, trying to keep him from getting in the ring. Because, you know, the fucking team, his team was in need, right? The boy, he, he had to come to fucking Babyface's rescue. <clears throat> so, God, Dream keeps running, but now he's got a guy hanging on him and the guy's feet are dragging. I looked around <laughs> and saw this. Cause, and here he comes, and Dream is over, leaning behind him, Whack, whack, hitting the guy while still running, hitting him to get him to turn loose, right? So he wasn't really punched him in the face or anything. He just whacking on him. And, and the, he lost the guy and rolled in the ring, did the run in. The Bobby started to come out, as a matter of fact, to see if he needed any help. And so the cops grabbed the guy. But, of course, he pressed charges because the dream machine beat him up. And me and Bobby were the witnesses. So 
the court is in Lexington. I think they managed to get it booked or in some kind of way where they were in Louisville here the night before. And then we got to go over the next day to court. Right. And that's where the dream that on the trip that gave me the story about now, don't, don't expose the business, say what, you know, tell the truth, what happened, but nothing about anything, you know, about whether, you know, he said, it's more important that we protect the baby. He's the one going to court, right? He's more important. We protect the business. I said, I got you, Troy, right? I, I, I got it. But, and then Bobby, because he's a witness, but he wanted to dress up. He'd gotten a fucking uh, brand new white shirt, but it was still in the package. So we actually opened it up in the car on the way over there. He put it on and it's like wrinkled because it's all, it's literally, he's just taking the collar thing and everything. So it looks like it, it was carried in his wallet. And none of the three of us, because I hadn't become a manager yet, none of the three of us knew how to tie a tie. We had to stop at a gas station, <laughs> have the fucking gas station guy tie the fucking, I think Dream didn't have a shirt that he could fucking wear a tie with. I don't think. Anyway, um, and that, and that, so we, and it, he got off. It was, it was uh, self-defense on the part of the Dream Machine. And, and thankfully they didn't ask Bobby a lot of questions. <laughs> I was going to say, what was Bobby like on the stand? Well, it was just, he looked out and saw, yeah, the guy tackled him. You know, the guy tackled him. Uh, he was just trying to get away. That was, it wasn't <laughs> like he was, you know, the attorneys tell us, fucking, when you're given testimony, don't give too many details. They didn't have to worry with Bobby. He stuck straight to the meat of the matter. He just tried to get away. I was going to ask you before, and, you know, I would love to hear what you want to say about Bobby's early days, how he got into the business, because, you know, one of the great mysteries is how did he end up so good? <laughs> it's really hard to explain, but just the other day after the news, you know, Bobby was one of my favorites and I put up some pictures on the wrestling news, Twitter account, and there were photos you took of Bobby yep. when you were a photographer. And I was looking at those and comparing He's 15 them. 15 feet in the air. That's what I was going to say. I was comparing those to other photos of other wrestlers from the same time period of Memphis that you took. You don't have action shots like that of too many other guys. He's 15 feet in the air doing everything on those shitty Memphis rings that the mats never got cleaned. The boards never got changed. The padding was indoor, outdoor carpeting. And he's fucking, if he took a slam off the top, he landed two thirds away across the ring. If he was dropping the knee off the top, he was three feet above the top turnbuckle. If he was getting backdropped over the top rope, you couldn't see him grabbing anything. He was just going. It was, it was just, you know, it, he was a step. And he, in those days, and, and especially we'll talk about this in a minute, the early mid South stuff too, but he was like 210 pounds. He's six feet one or whatever, but he was lean. And then that's the thing of he, no physique. When he gained weight, he got chubby. When he was when he was 18 years old, main event for Nick Goulas, he was chubby. And when he got in shape, he had no discernible muscle tone at all. But he was hard as a rock, and he was lean like a greyhound. And he could. And then when he tried to gain weight again to get you know with the, working with the road warriors and guys like that, he would just get a bit chubby. But, it, you know, that was it's not like he he didn't work out in the gym regularly. But my guy, it's not like he wasn't doing more cardio than anybody else in the business every night. And he did go to the gym on occasion and he did a lot of squats. He was just always in shape, except when he tried to gain weight to look bigger than, you know, some of the other guys. And then, he, you know, it just slowed him down. Go ahead. I'm sorry. What were you going to say? No, well, like I said, I'd want to certainly hear what you have to say about Bobby breaking into the business in his early days. But in terms of you and Bobby, what was it like for you to shoot him at ringside? And also, when did you actually get to know him? Because he was obviously a regular for Nick Goulas after the split. When did you first meet Bobby? Well, that's the thing. <laughs> I, again, Dennis Condry comes into this just because it's a funny story. <clears throat> because I met Dennis five and a half years, almost six years before I met Bobby, because Bobby had never worked for Jarrett until Nick went out of business. But Dennis Condry came in in 1975 to or late 74 to the Tennessee territory as a baby face for, his, for the very first time he was there. And he was one of the first wrestlers that when I started taking my Kodak Instamatic 
and started hanging out by where they came out to, you know, look for girls or whatever. I took, I, he was one of the first guys I took a posed picture of and actually like, Hey, can I take a picture of you? Sure. Go ahead. Right. Boom. At the very almost same time, probably as a matter of fact, yeah, pretty much at that same time, a kid in Huntsville that's helping set the ring up so he can get into the matches for free. Dennis would see him at the other end of the territory. I was 13. The ring boy is 16. If you'd have walked up to Dennis and said, Hey, that fucking 13 year old goofy kid that just took your picture with the Kodak <laughs> Instamatic and a 16 year old chubby kid putting a ring up in Huntsville last night in nine years, you guys are going to main event to Superdome. What the fuck do you think he would have said? He would have said, I can't believe it. Me, Jim Cornette, and Orville Hutto? I don't believe it. <laughs> but but that's, that's the thing. So I never met Bobby. Uh, I had seen him. And obviously, um, Nick's TV, briefly, he got TV on here in 1978 and tried to come in and run opposition. And I saw Bobby on the TV there. And actually, uh, I went to Nick's first show. I knew I couldn't go to all of them or they'd get hot at me over, uh, you know, the, uh, the other side of the fence. Uh, and that was, uh, you know, my photography job and et cetera. And also I knew that Nick was not going to win this war, but I wanted to see the Sheik and Fargo right live. So I went to the first show and Bobby was on, I think the second match, uh, preliminary where they, he beat the beast with a cross body or something off the, turnbuckle and it was you know nothing particularly spectacular because and there was like 300 people there but then i got to see him a little bit on nick's tv that that year but more the following year especially when i got my battery operated television i'd take in the car when we were going to spot shows i could pick up wbko 13 out of bowling green you could see nick's tv saturday nights from 10 30 to 11 30 on the way back from the one of those spot shows uh, but really then he got booked in Atlanta and was on Georgia TV for a while after Nick closed in 1980. And then finally Jarrett brought him in and that's where I first met him. And he was the mid America champion cause he'd had that belt for, for Nick. And, um, and I mean, he was, you know, one of Jimmy Hart's first family. And of course, instantly I'm taking pictures of all of Jimmy Hart's guys. Cause Jimmy loved to have pictures taken. And Bobby, he was just the nicest guy in the world, but those matches him, Singles matches with Bill Dundee, uh, Bobby and, and Coco Ware when he was Sweet Brown Sugar as heels. They were the one of the most exciting tag teams in the business. And that's what 1981, I was watching every territory's television show. And there were bigger drawing teams and bigger name teams, but you weren't seeing any tag teams that were doing it. Coco was going crazy then because that was his first big push so he was doing the fucking missile drop kicks off the top rope and the fist drops because he was you know he was Lawler was his hero growing up too in Union City so he's doing the fist drop off the top Coco but he's doing it like Bobby 15 feet in the air and they were just tremendous together um but Bobby had you know he had great matches he had a good match with me and Jimmy Hart People have seen that fucking video where all the fans hit the ring when he's throwing Hart's supposed $5,000 out to the crowd and we got mobbed and started a riot. I got knocked out by a fucking unseen fan when there was 40 of them in the ring. Uh, but Bobby could make us look good. And that was the thing. People would come through the Tennessee Territory names that were guesting in and out of the AWA or Florida or whatever. And people kind of started hearing, Hey, there's this kid in Memphis. You wouldn't believe how good he is. But it, it, Bobby never, he never, he wasn't an assertive person or a confrontational person. He didn't, he didn't try to get booked and he, he got discovered by just doing his job. But when Watts came to Memphis, Bobby was just on the card doing what he'd done, but really he worked for Nick all his life because he was from Huntsville and he grew up there. And I, I mean, you know, he's, he got started when he was 16, him and Orville Hutto as the Brown bombers doing jobs on TV, but they got to see what was going on. And Orville didn't make it necessarily, but, um, 
but Bobby became Nick Goulas's son, George's tag team partner, because Bobby was the baby face that could work and could sell and he could tag George, George would make a comeback and the heels good bump for him. And, and the jet set. As, yeah. The jet set. Cause one of them <laughs> could come off the top rope and the other one. Well, see, Nick, <laughs> Nick had heard about, you know, somebody had said to Nick, well, you need younger talent. You need these young people, right? <laughs> so the, last pop culture reference that Nick had had referred to from, you know, people referring to young people, oh, they're the jet set. So he made his young team, the jet set. But, but when, when Nick went under, like I said, you know, Bobby went to Atlanta, I think probably as much and they didn't use, he was on the card and he, I think it had the TV title maybe for a week or two or whatever, but it was probably just because somebody had seen him. He needed a place to go. And then, you know, Jarrett realized, well, whatever. But he didn't actively try to go places because he never, until the Midnight Express started, he never viewed himself as a main event guy. He just liked being a wrestler and was happy to to be a wrestler and doing it and in the business. But he didn't have the confidence that, you know, that he'd be a, that he'd main event Superdome one of those days. And he had all the talent in the world, but then when, when finally when we got that spot, and then all of a sudden, he got the confidence to go with it, and so it was it was all about us. This is our turn to get over, and you can do your shit, and we appreciate it. Well, then he just fucking blew up, and and you know that's uh well, some of the people that tweeted, um, Ric Flair. Not only did he tweet about Bobby, but also uh, this Ric Flair in 1989 was not only the world champion, he was the booker in WCW. He was in charge of, of matchmaking for fuck's sake. He'd, uh, in 1989, he had worked a program with Ricky Steamboat. He'd worked a program with Terry Funk. He's fixed to go into a program with Sting before Sting got hurt later on. Um, but he's the booker also. And when he wants to defend the world title on television, just for ratings and to have a good match and show that WCW is a superior product to the WWF, he picked Bobby Eaton. And, and, and not only did he pick Bobby, he didn't want to beat him. And even us, I, I, I'm on a fucking booking team with Rick. I said, what he told me, he said, we'll do a DQ. I said, what? He said, I don't need to beat him. I said, but, but Rick, you know, it, you, it, it's a no, he didn't want to beat Bobby. It, he just, he had never had a chance to have a singles match with Bobby. And of anybody on the roster at the time in what was it, December of 1989, Rick Flair wanted to wrestle Bobby Eaton and didn't want to beat him on TV when he was a world champion. And as I've told the story, then Heard got hot. Well, how did Bobby Eaton get a title match? He dropped in out of a helicopter and he, you couldn't even beat him? So then Flair's all right. And and I pitched him the idea, to be honest with you, because Flair said, I'll work with him again. And he, I'll, this time I'll beat him. I said, I got an idea. Beat all of us up. Make the old fart happy. So we did the rematch. And he not only jerked me in the ring, grabbed, hit me with my own racket, knocked me out, fucking hit Stan, knocked him out, and fucking hit Bobby with a racket, knocked him out, and fucking pinned the one, two, three. And I don't think Heard was still happy about that, but it, but then that's he that's the extent that Flair resented that anybody would question why he would want to work with Bobby Eaton on. And by the way, it, from the Midnight Express scrapbook, the first. Uh, Flair versus Eaton match we did in Columbus, Ohio on actually November 20th, 1989. And it was the Sunday night main event show, which as you'll recall, Brian was on so TBS on Sunday nights at six o'clock Eastern, 3 p 3 p.m. Sunday afternoon on the West Coast, right? It did a 3.3 rating, a 5.6 share, and was seen in one point one million seven hundred and thirty two thousand homes and in 89 they figured what just under or just over two people per home so say three and a half million people and it was the highest rated sunday tbs show in a year with a cold match with rick flair and bobby eaton that jim heard got hot about so he had the rematch 
And we did that in fucking brutally cold, goddamn, miserable Peoria, Illinois on December 14th. And that match I just described, and that did a 3.2 rating, a 5.0 share in 1,667,000 homes, the highest rated Sunday night TBS wrestling program since the previous Ric Flair Bobby Eaton match. And anyway, um, but not only Flair. Uh, somebody actually retweeted a clip of the match that I'd forgotten about. I remembered at the time I forgot about it since it's been 25 or more years. But remember Randy Savage versus Bobby Eaton on WCW syndication in its dying days of its syndicated show where it was all the stars were getting fucking four minute squashes or whatever over whoever. And that's where they weren't using Bobby at the time. Well, but he gets booked with Randy Savage and Savage works competitive with him and fucking che heals him to fucking beat him. Cause it was Bobby Eaton. He, and I, we've talked about how business Randy Savage was when he came to Knoxville, things he did for me and what he would do something that was right for the business, but he wasn't going to go treat Bobby Eaton like a job guy because it was what 1979s so had been 15 years before that. Nobody in wrestling would hire Randy Savage except for Nick Goulas, and he and Bobby Eaton were doing our broadways in front of no people over the Mid America title, having some of the best matches in the business, and you know, three hundred people seeing him. Yeah, in the eighties, when Savage was doing revolutionary stuff in the WWF, and Bobby was doing revolutionary stuff in Crockett Promotions, they stole it from each other. That's what I was going to ask. How much of that was stuff they learned against each other working for Goulas? Well. Bobby was mad because he could never do correctly or felt proper about doing it. The thing where you grab the guy's hair that Savage would do, you grab the guy's hair and you run across the ring, jump over the top rope and spring his neck on the yeah. fucking rope. He said, yeah, one time in the car, he said, God damn it, Corny. He said, I could never get that. He said, fucking Savage, I could never get that. But also, think about what was Savage's fucking premier deal, the elbow off the top. It was a great elbow, and, and it was definitely stiffer than Bobby's, but Savage couldn't come off the top like Bobby Eaton could, but they were, except for that double sledge off the top to the floor, which is why that Savage ended up having more knee problems than Bobby did. But they fucking, they invented that shit with each other, a lot of it, when they were working those matches, because who else was Savage going to do a lot of that stuff with at that point in time? It's amazing how many of the best guys of the 80s came out of really ghoulous at the end. Right? Terry Gordy, Randy Savage, yeah. Bobby Eaton. Well, you can't you can't really give uh Nick credit for Gordy and Hayes because they stopped in there on the way to uh on the way to Jarrett and then really mid south where they got over. But that's where Bobby met Terry and Michael and they used to ride around together. He told me this one when he went to Georgia, he'd already known him from up there, right? And, and fucking, they're they're driving back from a town in Georgia. Bobby Eaton, Terry Gordy, Michael Hayes, Buddy Roberts, and there's beer cans, literally, especially in the back seat. He said up to people's fucking knees, empty beer cans, and they get pulled over for speeding by the cops, and the fucking cop comes up on the side of the road, and I don't, it might have been Gordy driving, I don't know, but he opened the door, <laughs> and when he opened the fucking driver's door to get out to meet the cop not only did all those beer cans start falling out onto the fucking pavement but the whole interior door panel of his old beat up fucking <laughs> Cadillac it read, fell out in the fucking street and the cop looked at it, and there's the fabulous Freebirds. they're on goddamn Atlanta TV right and is like fuck you guys just get the fuck out of here it's my county right he didn't even give them a ticket which would happen back in those days Hey, you, you bring um, up Georgia. I actually found one of the first photos that Gene Gordon sent to the Wrestling News of Bobby Eaton when he got to Georgia. And the caption that Gene Gordon wrote is, Bobby Eaton, who is from Nashville, Tennessee, a young Matt Ace, who is rapidly gaining recognition in Georgia rings, photo by Gene Gordon, March 1981. <laughs> well, and uh, he wasn't there too much longer. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? As a matter of fact, that's what it was. Bobby, when Nick folded up, Bobby came over to work for Jarrett for a couple months, went to Georgia for a few months, and then came back to Memphis. 
That's the way it happened, and teamed up with Coco. Nevertheless, um, and you know, you you asked earlier on um, how Bobby got so good, right? And what because what had happened was, and because I mean, I asked the same thing. Well, I, you know, years ago, I asked him, "Well, how did you get started?" And etc. But nobody trained him till he started doing jobs on TV. Because, as we said, he back in those days, they had wrestling every week at your local arena. And Huntsville, it was the Huntsville Coliseum. And Coliseum is probably an inappropriate word for this building, right? But it sounds good <laughs> on paper. But kids would hang out at the back door and see if Pat Malone in Memphis would have five or six of them go, go sell programs for me, boy. I'll give you a nickel apiece or whatever. Or somebody need to help Holland setting the ring up with the posts. Hey, I'll let you in free in the bleachers. If you carry these ring posts and then whoever was hauling the ring, this was a classic buddy Wayne ploy. Whoever was hauling the ring would then sit and point a lot and drink a bottle of pop while these kids, he's going to let in free <laughs> carried the ring post but anyway. And Bobby and his friend Orville Hutto started getting in the ring and imitating the shit that they'd seen on television. And it got to the point where some of the boys, when they would get, if they got there early enough, because they wouldn't let them do it when the people were in the in the building before they opened the doors, you know, whatever. But some of the boys that would get there would go, "What, what the fuck? He's he's, he's kind of good enough to be on fucking television." So they had him start doing jobs, the Brown Bombers. There are pictures of him and Orville as the Brown Bombers, <clears throat> and then. Um, obviously being around Bobby, everybody, you know, took a liking to him and, and, you know, I'm not saying that Nick immediately wanted to put him in the will and, you know, adopt him alongside George, but they, obviously they let Tojo start working with him because Tojo and I, a lot of modern fans or people that weren't there and didn't experience it. will look at a picture of Tojo Yamamoto and go, what the fuck? But Tojo was not only the guy that, going back to the early 60s, that Nick Goulas would have if Japanese wrestlers came over, the Anoki, and and uh, all the way through Onita and Fuchi and et cetera, they put him with Tojo to teach him how to work more of an American style, how to think about the crowds, and also to, you know, it was kind of like the deal. Tojo will take the young guys. But as, uh, not only the Japanese guys, but Tojo worked with Jerry Jarrett, Tommy Rich. He was the first partner of Jerry Jarrett, first partner of Tommy Rich, but he'd been riding with them before that. He did the same thing with Bobby. He started, even though Bobby was a baby face, he started working with him as far as, you know, verbally telling him things. And then they switched Bobby heel for a run so he could, when Tojo was a manager, so he could actually work, you know, alongside him. Tojo wasn't training guys how to fucking take backdrops. Tojo would train the guys how to think, how to understand the wrestling business, how to play their part. Um, Jerry Jarrett would tell a famous story that he'd ride down the road. He was be, he would be driving. Tojo would be in the passenger seat. And he said, let me see your ear. And Tojo with that accent and Tojo would grab and he'd take his fingernails and he would dig his fucking thumbnail as hard as he could into fucking Jerry Jarrett's earlobe. And he said, look in the mirror, your face. Ah, Tojo quit. What the fuck? He said, okay. He said, now give me your ear. No, no, no. Give me your ear. And then he would take and he would work and he'd take the meat of his finger and he'd just barely squeeze. And he'd say, you make same face and mirror as I do before that working. And over a period of time, and plus sometimes a Tojo would take some of the young guys in the ring and beat the shit out of them too, uh, to see whether they, you know, had it in them. But he was always the guy that polished Nick's projects. And Bobby loved Tojo for that, but that was the, that's why he learned. He, he was a natural. You couldn't, he just saw it and got it and understood how to do it, performing the moves. But from the time he was a teenager, not only was he a fan, he watched what went on, 
He saw the way the baby faces did the promos and made the fiery comebacks. He saw the way the heels got heat. He said Kurt and Carl Von Braun are scared the shit out of him. He thought they were going to kick shit out of him when he was 13. Um, but he got instructed early on in how to think about the wrestling business and how to have matches. And he's in there working with the best guys, veterans, you know, who knew how to call matches and put matches together where it kept everybody uh, strong unless they didn't want to, unless they wanted to bury somebody. And then he learned how to bury people on purpose. Not that he would do it, but he learned how to nip up out from under it. Uh, but that's that kind of, you know, that was the education. And that's why so many, so many of the, the guys that worked with him in the ring just respected him so much because not only did he, did he do things that in no way were going to injure them, but he did things that made them look better, even if he was going over them. And that wasn't the case, you know, with a lot of guys. Um, and you know, that's when I talk about the education that some of the modern guys miss and I'm not even being ornery now. I'm just, that's the kind of education that a lot of the guys miss and you can't get, and it's been misinterpreted or et cetera. But, but I'm not going to be ornery today. And as a matter of fact, I want to say this also, um, a lot of people tweeted, including the folks at AEW tweeted a nice graphic and a respectful message about Bobby. And I know that some of the AEW personnel in various positions listen to the show and I'm not, that's not a snide comment either. Um, because I'm wondering if, if, if anybody with uh, access to Tony Khan can get to him, tell him that I've heard everything that he said about Bobby and how respectful it was and how nice it was. And I thank you, Tony. Uh, Tony Khan is not a horrible human being. We may see way far apart on wrestling and a variety of issues, but that was a cool thing to do, Tony. So I hope somebody will deliver that message to him. Um, but anyway, so then Bobby gets into business, as I said, and you know, that's why he was figured in for Nick all that time, because not only could Nick, I mean, he was such a dependable guy and you wanted to use him and what a talent he was, but also at the same time, he's home. He's, he doesn't want to leave. He's not trying to leave. He's not trying to hold anybody up. You know, Bobby just wanted to be a wrestler. And that, uh, until the, until we got the spot in the midnight express, I don't, he never realized how, valuable he was or how good he was or that he was a top guy uh he wouldn't put himself uh, you know me bobby eaton i'm on the same plane as the road warriors or this or that but but he started to get an idea of how to carry himself and gave him even more confidence when we got the spot with the midnight express well speaking of that spot with the midnight express i am curious about another thing you were relatively new to the performance side of the business. You got involved in 82. You guys go to Mid-South at the end of 83. Dennis had been a veteran. He'd been around for years all over the South. Every, Really, every promotion in the South, Dennis had worked for. Bobby, similar thing. I can't think of where either guy would have worked, and you'll correct me where I'm wrong, where they had killer road trips. What was the adjustment to Mid-South like for the three of you? Well, um... Well, first of all, Dennis had not worked all over the South. Think about this. And this is another reason why, and it's a shame that Dennis is so underappreciated today. And also he left right before the pay-per-view era where those big main event matches and quality video would be replayed over and over. Dennis was another guy. He was a different case than Bobby in that he was – he was so good, he was fixed in the Tennessee territories. And he had worked Georgia, but he he didn't get a spot to go to Florida. He didn't get a spot to go to the Carolinas. Actually, I've told a story. Joe Turner was his brother-in-law, and he'd really broken in in the Carolinas as a, as a referee just for a, a bit. But he never got to – he always wanted to – Dennis Condry always wanted to work the Carolinas because he had seen the territory and how – 
big and profitable it was and everything. But when Dennis had gotten a spot in later on in 75 as partners with Phil Hickerson in for Nick, then he really spent most of the rest of the next three years. He and, and Phil would go to work for Ron Fuller in Knoxville and Ron Wright would manage him. And then they'd come back to work for Nick. And then they, when Jarrett split off, they'd come to work for Jarrett. And one time rock Hunter was their manager for very briefly did not work out, but they could both talk on their own. Um, and they bounced around the ten of the three Tennessee territories until Phil got hurt, had to quit the business for a while. And then Dennis still, that's when he got with uh, Randy Rose and, Norvell Austin in 81 and 82, and they did the Midnight Express only in Continental and in, in Memphis. And that's, you know, Dennis had never been a top, top spot in a money drawing territory, except, you know, Memphis did good, but they were never figured in really he and Phil as far as major payoffs. So he had all the experience in the world. And, and and what an impeccable worker. And I'll tell you, I've gone back and looked some stuff the past couple of days in both of them. But they just hadn't had the the exposure in a major territory that said, I'm going to put you guys as – I'm going to use you guys as main event attractions and I'm going to give you a push. Um, And until we all went to work for Watts. And so the question you asked, what kind of transition was it? The, the trips were the – I mean the trips were a big deal, but the trips were the least of it. But what I did, uh, honestly, I got the news overnight, Wednesday night, and Thursday, besides being on the phone with Dennis Condry and Stan Lane and, and Bobby's friend Brian Thompson and Matt Sigmund who, uh, of the Heat Seekers who organized the Don't Tell Bobby show that we did about a year and a half ago in Knoxville where we – K faved him and just advertised it on the internet because he wouldn't see it there. Um, I talked to those guys and, and by the way, and, and Matt Sigmund was behind the go. There was a GoFundMe that was put up, uh, for about, I don't even know if it was up for 24 hours and that was by Matt Sigmund and it's for Bobby's funeral expenses and any medical and money, rest of the money would be going to the kids, whatever. But, they took it down after only a day because I think they were wanting 10 grand and they got over 20 that quick. And they took it down because at first the kids had, had not wanted any, you know, type of fundraiser or thing or whatever. And, and Dundee's going to be pitching in. But then when they were, Matt said, no, we want to do it and everybody wants to do it. But then they took it down point being after they'd raised over, over twice as much as they were looking for, because they didn't want it to look like they were just trying to raise money. And, uh, you know, and, and honestly, I bet they would have got a hundred thousand dollars and it's, you know, it's not like it was a shady deal. So I wish they'd have left it up, but that just goes to show you, they didn't, they didn't want anybody to have a ill memory of anything Bobby was associated with. Anyway, where was I going with all of this? What was I saying? Oh, so we went to Louisiana. And that was the thing. <sighs> After I talked to those people the other day, a fan here several years ago had gotten me a 30-something disc Midnight Express compilation. And it's in fairly chronological order, start to finish. And and I mentioned on the drive through that we did this earlier this week, Stacy's in California because her mother's had heart surgery and she's doing better and fine and appreciates everybody talking about that. And then I hurt my back, although on further reflection, it is my hip that I've had issues with before in a major way. And, and so since I, it was a struggle to walk from room to room and I couldn't get in any position besides flat that wasn't painful, I said, I'm going to watch these. DVDs and curl up on the bed with Harley Quinn. And that's where I realized, because when you look at something, even that yeah, we, I was there, I was in the middle of it, but it's 38 years later, seven years later, whatever. And you look at things with fresh eyes and you understand things better. And I realize now that 
for one thing, I sucked when I got to Mid-South. For me. And I don't mean this to sound egotistical, but yes, everybody's like, oh, that kid, he can talk his ass off. No, it wasn't. I am shooting holes in a lot of my promos in Mid-South. And But... It, 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 if I could have if, if I could have gone to Mid South like I was when I went to Dallas a year later after having that course in wrestling from Bobby and Dennis and Bill Watts and Bill Dundee, I believe they probably would have killed me because I started kind of figuring out how to fucking actually do this right for me. But anyway, all of us and Bobby in particular realize that this was a big opportunity because it, I mean me I've only been to business 16 months so I'm like somebody else besides who I was just working for wants me that's a big opportunity uh, but Dennis knew especially that he'd been around that long and no promoter of that level had ever come and said I'm going to build around you we're going to give you a push you are going to be a main event fucking talent we're going to protect you <clears throat> so as I said Dennis's work was always impeccable it was never flashy and it wasn't big things it was always being in the right place never being lost never making a mistake uh, the timing the uh, etc and the psychology and he was the one that was telling both of us how to think but going back and watching Bobby it was incredible because I'd seen him have all these matches in Memphis and I knew what he could do, but I'd never seen him do all of it that much that well in front of that many people. He was just on every night and watching the crowd react to, or the crowds on these videos, like I've, one of our first matches and probably the first time he dropped a knee off the top rope in Houston at Sam Houston Coliseum was against Magnum TA and wrestling too in that program. And the people are already, you know, hot into it and they're reacting and it's Houston. It's a hot crowd anyway. But Brian, you know, the, you know, the, the pop that they get now these days, when you show a video where somebody fucks up and misses a dive or fall, it's, it's that person is obviously fucked up. That sound, not a boo or a yay, or a wow, but a oh, like, oh, shit. You know what I'm talking about. Of course. That was the kind of reaction that Bobby was getting. And this is in Houston, Texas. They've seen all the best talent. They've had weekly or bi-weekly matches for 50 years at that point in the Sam Houston Coliseum. Bobby's knee drop off the top rope or some of the other shit, the bumps that he would take, we're getting on purpose and done correctly. We're getting the pop like, Oh, he just fucked that guy up. Those people had still never seen anything like that. And I mean, you know, <clears throat> with wrestling too, it, it was, it was like Bobby and Dennis were both in until we got with the rock and roll. We're both in with guys that they had either e never worked with or barely ever worked with before. Right. Uh, Dennis had had passing, you know, contact with wrestling too in Georgia or whatever, but, um, but it, it, the midnight were having their matches and they were calling the matches because it was, I, it was the midnight's job to get over. But at the same time, they were going in with guys like Magnum, who was so green. I, I'm watching now and, and some of the things I haven't seen for 30 years, I'm seeing, Magnum being totally lost and just actually turn around at one point out of frustration. You just walk out of the ring and get back on the apron. He just got just everybody else is where they're supposed to be. And he just got lost as <laughs> oh fuck it. I'm just leaving, but he'd only been in business a year and a half, right? He's in the main events. People loved him, but he's green, but they're calling these matches for these guys. They've never worked with and never been with it, it, to do all of their, all of those guys stuff to them and taking bumps for it and getting those guys over. And in the process, Dennis explained it. We get over by getting the match over. And then, good Lord, there's a goddamn 
giant motorcycle rally with police escorts going down the street outside the castle here. Um, Dennis's philosophy was we go out and we get over by getting the match over and then getting the heat at the end, whether it's because we fucked them on the finish or if we put them over, we get heat after, or the, obviously I go out on TV and get the heat back verbally. And another thing, well, we can, we can do the fucking happy horse shit where the baby faces are kicking the shit out of us at the start and everybody's happy because we make them laugh and then we make them mad because we made them quit laughing when we take over and we're kicking the shit out of their, their fucking guys. So uh, Bobby's in there with two and two's in his early fifties. So it's not like he's going to keep up a running race with fucking Bobby Eaton, but Bobby wants to get all of, you know, he wants to get over and he knows that two's knee lift is over. So this was great. Bobby was like a greyhound running the ropes and he would just call a simple spot with two where two could just stay in the middle of the ring and Bobby do all the fucking work. And two was a pro. He'd been a veteran for 30 years, Johnny Walker. He knew how to give you a hip toss. He knew how to give you an arm drag. He knew how to fucking give you a knee lift. He knew how to, you call a spot to him. He can remember it. So in one of these Houston matches, they lock up and two gets the fucking head or Bobby gets the headlock. And two shoots him off, and it's one tackle, drop down, arm drag, arm drag, hip toss, knee lift. Just that simple, where two can just stay in the middle of the ring, and Bobby's the one crossing the fucking ring and doing all the work. But it's at 100 miles an hour. It's flawless. And then not only does when – two, when two gives him the knee lift, Bobby has taken the arm drag, arm drag, hip toss. He's come up, bent over, selling his face and his back where he's been tossed around in perfect position as two hits him with the knee lift. He turns and flies over the fucking top rope, barely touching anything. It lands on the goddamn floor outside and the place blows because he would figure out a way to take a bump and land in a place that you would never expect. So it, it surprised people as well as popping them at the same time. So he could have taken a bump from the fucking knee lift and the place would have popped, but he takes a bump and flies over the top rope when it doesn't look humanly possible that somebody could have done that from that direction. And the place goes batshit. And you ought to say the poor, I think Alice Marie Nelson was the photographer in Houston. I'm watching these matches and I'm thinking, you know, we've talked about Mid-South was, was, had been down because the guys were a little bigger and a little slower, Right. And they weren't having matches like this, and they weren't doing these Tennessee spots. And the photographers and the ring seconds, they're all running because they can't figure out which direction one member of the Midnight Express is going to take a bump on top of them next. Because it's it's completely different style of spots and style of tag team matches than they'd been seeing, and, and everybody was, you know, flipped out by it. But anyway, that's where, you know... You go back and look at, and some of this stuff's on YouTube for for folks, and I I don't know what's on the network or the Peacock or whatever, but watch Bobby Eaton in 1984 Mid South, and, and watch Dennis Condry too while you're at it. Um, there's nobody doing anything like either one of them today, and that's not knocking the modern wrestling. That's when you watch this with a critical eye, you can see nobody takes bumps this, and they're calling it all in the ring. There's nothing pre-planned except the finish, and that's probably been handed to us verbally by a referee or a go-between. So you can tell when things don't quite work out because the guy that they're doing it with has heard it just now for the first time, but they cover it. You can't tell. They were just so smooth. And that's uh, – I was talking to Dennis Condry, obviously, Thursday morning, and, you know, he was, I'll be, <laughs> this is something funny. He said, he said, Cordy, I've gone from a semi badass to an old maid because we were both crying ridiculously to the point where we had to hang up at one point because we were embarrassed for each other. Um, but I've never, I've seen Dennis of, of the recent years, the kinder, gentler Dennis Condry tear up a little bit at a banquet speech or whatever or is or something, but I've never heard Dennis uh, or seen Dennis cry actually out loud before, but I've only known him 45 years. So there's a first time for everything, but 
he was he was he was we were all thanking each other for what we'd done for each other, et cetera. But I told him, I said, that was the thing when we all got there, Bobby and, and to our first, obviously first break, Bobby and Dennis had the talent and the experience and Dennis could cut a promo. And I always was entertained by his promos, even more so in person. But it, it the only thing they couldn't do was talk. And the only thing that I could do was talk because we mentioned, I've never had any the first time I ever took any bump in a wrestling ring. The first 10 years of my career, the first time I ever took that bump was in front of people because there was no practice. And you, if you couldn't figure out how you were going to do something, you asked somebody in the locker room, then they'd tell you verbally do this. Yeah. Memphis wasn't known for training their managers <laughs> how to take bumps. Well, n- nobody was, you didn't have goddamn, nobody I've said this before. We didn't get there early enough to practice. You were in, if you were in a business, well, okay. But anyway, um, but also as far as Watts was so strict, he wanted wrestling in his matches more so than in the Tennessee territory or some other territories, but Bobby and Dennis could adapt to that, but I'm seeing them kind of work a different style. And then I start to understand the difference in the styles of the different territories and how you would adapt. Cause then when we went to Dallas, it was a different thing entirely because they had, they didn't care about so much wrestling, wrestling in the matches as Watts did. Uh, it was, it, it was more, high spots and or just solid work, but the rings were harder and you had to adapt. (laughs) And even Bobby had to adapt because those rings were fucking ridiculously stiff. They were padded to the hilt and had no give. So that's the exact opposite of a good bumping ring. But that's a point I'm making is that, that Bobby and Dennis were able to either just in the car or after we'd get a finish explain to me just little bits of timing or little things, or we just talk about what other people I'd hear them talk about what other people were doing wrong. And, and plus I got more confident also from being there and doing it and say, okay, this is working. Uh, They're not going to send us home. So I was able, as I said, in a year there, a lot of learning, a lot of things from Watts and being able to do the promos transform from night and day. I'm more Jim Cornette when I get to Dallas of the people that would know what Jim Cornette was. And really the Midnight Express was more as well because they'd had that, we'd ha- all had that year to to not only figure each other out, but them to help bring me along. Because I knew how to talk and almost nothing else about serious in ring psychology or how to put the matches together or what the fuck's stupid to do or not to do. And that was, you know, where being in a car with Bobby and Dennis was, was him. And Dennis would sit there and plainly lay something out. Whereas it was with Bobby, it was just like, he'd have observations or he'd just say things or make a joke or something. And you'd kind of pick it up. You know, one of the great things about Mid-South in 84 was the introduction of Power Pro Wrestling, which meant house show matches got on TV. And there's a few that always stay with me, maybe because parts of those matches were used in the opening of the show eventually, but it's two Bobby bumps. One is simple, just him selling a punch and the way he would grab his jaw and kind of go on to one foot for a second. It was yeah. perfect. And the other was... I don't remember if it had the orange canvas or not, but it was a Jim Duggan clothesline to Bobby. The spear. The spear. One of the, Wasn't it? it was or, a, no, it was the clothesline and he went over backwards. He went over backwards. And we've seen yeah. like acrobatic wrestlers do that where it looks flashy, but it looked there. It's so impressive. He knocked him over backwards. It looks like Jim Duggan's power knocked him over backwards. It looks so you know, incredible. You, you know why? Because he did. Because Jim Duggan's power knocked him over backward. No, it, I've got, uh, I've just watched five matches with Bobby take the bump the exact same way. Because what he would do is when Duggan, and actually I think somebody, who else, somebody else clothesline took the same bump. But when the guy would come with the clothesline with the right arm, Bobby would not only kick his feet out, but he would fucking have his left arm in front of the guy clotheslining him 
Can you see there? Wait a minute. Left. I'm trying. Well, he'd have his arm in front of the guy clothesline and he would hook the guy as the guy ran past him. He'd give himself a little spin and it would knock him literally fucking upside down. And sometimes he landed on the side of his fucking head because it was literally knocking him upside, you know, upside down and ass over tea kettle. But yeah, it was fucking. It, oh, yeah, that's with the, just the selling of the face. Yeah. If, if if normally a guy might give somebody a shoulder tackle and the guy take a flat back bump, but if you gave Bobby a shoulder tackle or you punched him in the face or whatever the fuck it may be, he made you boom. He'd, he'd and he had the slap before anybody did, and you couldn't. It took me a while to figure out Bobby's slap, right? So it wasn't like the fucking leg slap class these days, but. He would, if you hit him with the tackle, boom, he'd fucking grab his face. He would spit up in the air. He'd sell his fucking face. His feet would go bing, 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 like he's off balance. And then he would go fucking down to a knee and then bounce to his face. He would take a different kind of bump every time. And it looked like he'd got the shit knocked out of him. When I would, you know, he'd be holding the baby face and I'd swing the racket and the baby face moves and why whack, whack him and all I, I knew the sweet spot to exactly where to swing because when that baby face moved Bobby like a magician was going to turn his head a certain way and put his hand up and I would smack the fucking hand and uh and then when he got to trust me then he would stop putting the fucking hand up and I would just you know I'd know the spot and I don't remember ever potatoing him but the spit would fly and it would look like I'd fucking killed him um Whose idea was the crawling and the hugging and the kissing? Dennis Condry and Phil Higgerson used to do that. But, uh, I mean, it's not like they invented it. Right. That's right. classic Southern heel wrestling, right? Goddamn, um, Dennis is the more stern one. And obviously Stan figured into all of this later on with a different type of personality, but just ta- starting how we originated the flavor of the thing. Dennis has that stern personality and that stern face. And he's the one that, whereas Bobby, you know, was just the maniac, right? So Bobby get boom, boom, boom. He'd take three or four bumps and he'd get up on his knees and run on his knees. Wee, 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 all the way over and, and hug Dennis. And he's on his knees in front of Dennis. And of course, the predominantly Southern working class, potentially homophobic audiences would have a field day with this. And then Dennis would, Goddamn look at the baby face with a pissed off look and he'd reach down and he'd hold his hand out and Bobby'd tag it and he'd get in like, I'll do something about this. And then one, it was early on in, in Louisiana, one of the towns, Bobby and Dennis would give each other a high five before they would at the start of the match, right? And one in and one out and they'd start the match. Well, so then one time we started doing it where, okay, Bobby and Dennis high five each other. I high five Dennis. I high five Bobby. And I've got the racket in my hand. So one of the fives is the racket. And I, ju- and then at a spot show at some point, I just, you know what, as me and Bobby go to high five, I stop and I go, come here. And I give him a big hug, right? And he gives me a big hug and the place goes ballistic. But okay. This is a lot easier than taking bumps for this reaction. So immediately I turn around like, what? What's the matter? What are you talking, trying to wish him well and play <laughs> innocent, right? What? And they're throwing shit. And so th- it, it, I don't know if it was that night. We started doing that for a while. And then one night I added the kiss on the cheek. We go to high five, stop, hug instead. The people are fucking screaming. I'm like, what? what? What's the matter? What's the matter? I'm like, okay, Bobby, go in there and break him in half. And I've cup his chin like Christine Jarrett used to with the grip, but not hard (laughs) and turn his head and kiss him on the cheek. And my God, I've heard finishes that didn't get that much of response. And everybody today is going to be saying, Oh my God, that's horrible. I'm just telling you what the fucking people did. And what we did in those days was run across shit that people reacted to that we're just doing and do more of it. So that became and that even that outlet after Dennis, when Stan became a part of the team, we still did that same pre-match thing. Bobby and Dennis, or Bobby and Stan, high five. Me and Stan, high five. Me and Bobby, oh, whoops, hug, kiss on the cheek. Go get him, Tiger. What was a tougher move for Bobby? The move from the Tennessee Territory to Mid South, or the move from Huntsville to the Dark Side? 
<laughs> well, well, see, it didn't pay as well of uh, the move from Huntsville <laughs> to the dark side, but the move to, <clears throat> um, but anyway, that's, uh, and, and also you talked about getting a chance to ride with Bobby and, and just be around it. The, the car trips there were insane and we've told stories. I'm not going to beat everybody up on the horrible trips in mid South, but I've told stories about we would be broke down on the side of the road or with the night we rode to the back of the Baton Rouge Centroplex in a fucking chicken truck with feathers fucking coming off of us. I've told those stories. Um, but just riding with Bobby was better than, and, and once again, I was lucky because if, if they had all things been equal, Watts had said, Hey, this Jim Cornette, I want to use him as a top manager and just brought me to his territory and stuck me with two guys I didn't know and that didn't also have a vested interest in this working. Then I would have, you know, been, been back in Memphis or back here at home probably in six months. Because I, like I said, I not only did I not know anything, but also if you couldn't have coexisted with people that you needed to work with and ride with in those days in that territory, you were fucked. And a lot of the other guys in those days had had habits that uh, that I would not have been able to coexist with. So it, it was lucky, and and just being able to you know eight hundred miles in a car with Bobby Eaton, there's been worse things to happen. And it, it just, we could talk about wrestling from when we were both kids, because he'd been, you know, a fan since he was a kid. Or we knew this, you know, if you made a joke about somebody looks like so and so, we didn't even, either one have to Google that, right? But also, Bobby would do the, and we've talked about Stan's ribs. Dennis wasn't a big river. Dennis liked to laugh, Dennis make jokes, Dennis loved to, you know, knock people. We cut promos on everybody in the world in the car. But he wasn't a ribber. Stan was the guy that would come up with these well thought out, you know, pre planned and built up ribs. But Bobby just went with the simple stuff. If you had the fucking large gulp from Wendy's and you hadn't finished it yet, and you get out of the car to go in the gas station, take a piss, when you come back, you will find that he's taken the cap and the straw out and tied a knot in the bottom of the straw and put the cap back on. So when you try to take a drink, the top of your head caves in. He always had the gimmicks from the stores, the fake vomit and the, the fucking, uh, Oh God damn. What was that? Um, shit. The, uh, the, not the, uh, water squirting flower, but Oh, he got a water squirting cigarette and people knew he didn't smoke. Right. So he's got it in the locker room and everybody would come up and say, Bobby, you smoke. He went, well, <laughs> and he would squirt him with the water squirting cigarette. Um, uh, but it was just, you know, it was fun. It was fun, and it kept you from going insane. And then Bobby was just funny to be around. I got, I got to, I got to read you this. We've told you the story about Bobby's weak stomach, right? Of course, you've heard some of these. Yeah. Well, somebody tweeted this, and this is from Arn Anderson, and I, it, it's actually, I think it was in a, it's in a magazine, probably the WCW magazines. I don't know how long ago this was, but it's a, it was a tweet out of a column of, of that magazine. Anyway, Bobby Eaton and I used to play this game called burp and blow, which I'm sure every egghead in the business has done. You burp and then blow on your buddy. You know what I'm talking about? And then let the, yeah. One Sunday we were on interstate 70 in Missouri. It was pouring rain. I was driving and Bobby was sitting in the passenger seat. He leaned over to burp and blow. Bobby, being a drinking man, didn't anticipate that when he burped, he would throw up. But sure enough, he did all over my chest. Now, I realize I'm doing 70 miles per hour in a monsoon. And when the funk hit me in the nose, I started puking. And when I started puking, Bobby started puking again. I jerked the car off the road and got out. I jerked my shirt over my head to take it off, which made me even sicker. Then I jerked my pants off. I'm on a major U.S. highway, buck naked, puking all over the, the road. Bobby was in the same situation out the passenger door. And to top it off, ring announcer Tony Gillum was in the back seat, <laughs> and he was laughing so hard he pissed in his pants. <laughs> this is not a unique occurrence, but Bobby usually wasn't, uh, wasn't the first one to instigate the, the burp and blow or whatever. Um but there was, I've, I think I've told this story before, but it's been a long time. 
me, Bobby, Stan, and Bubba Rogers are in Memphis one time. And Dundee is there also, and we're we're at the hot we're staying at the, like the Holiday Inn at the airport. So Dundee's got a rental car. He's going to follow us back to the hotel in our car, or not follow us in our car back to the hotel. So there's two cars. Dundee's following us is what I'm trying to say. Well, as I recall, it was either cold weather or whatever. But me and Bubba were both sick with colds, and I'm driving, and Bobby's in the front seat, and Stan and Bubba are in the back seat. And I start coughing and get choked with phlegm, right? And you hear, you know, when you hear the phlegm noise, because Bobby had such a weak stomach, you could actually show him a booger and he would just start throwing up. Just show it on the end of your finger. Hey, Bobby, here's a booger. So I start coughing and I'm phlegmy. And it's causing Bobby to start doing that like that. And it, corn, when Bubba sees that Bobby is getting sick because he hears my phlegm, Bubba starts laughing, which causes, because he's sick, starts him to get phlegmy and he starts coughing. Now me and, and now I'm laughing, which is making me cough more. Bubba and I are both phlegm coughing <laughs> and laughing at the same time. And Bobby's getting sicker. Now Stan is starting to fucking laugh and he doesn't even really need to puke he's just laughing so hard he can't fucking control himself and he's afraid he might shit himself <laughs> and so bobby's quarter pull over I, I pull over on the side of the road off the interstate dundee pulls in behind us and you see all four doors of our car at the same time opens up and everybody jumps out <laughs> and starts throwing up on the ground <laughs> Yeah, I guess you had to be there. You know, um, there's a reputation Bobby has. You hear guys from WCW. Wait a minute, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you one more. Hold on, I'll tell you one more. Yeah. We're in Louisiana with Dennis, and the, the, the trip back from Little Rock, Arkansas, to Alexandria, Louisiana, was the worst one in the territory, really, because you left, and I think we were usually there on, on Sunday nights, but you left the Barton Coliseum in Little Rock at 10 o'clock, at night and you had 275 miles of two lane state highway to drive. So you, it's going to take you five and a half hours. At least you're not going to get back home till three 34 in the morning. And in those days from the Coliseum to get on the highway to go South, there was no fast food places open. This was no 24 hour drive through. So long story short, we would stop at a gas station on the Arkansas, Louisiana state line that had a counter with barbecue, smoked sausage, barbecue sauce, chicken, fried chicken breasts, uh, goddamn tater wedges, the whole nine yards, and stock up for dinner. And they also had a liquor store. And one night, since Bobby was driving, I'm in the back seat. Dennis decides he's going to get a bottle of fucking whiskey. Well, by the time he finishes alternating between the bottle of whiskey and the fucking barbecue we got, he's... <laughs> Barney, he, you're gassed. So Dennis <laughs> finishes with this box of barbecue and this sauce that we it gave us a big jug of this sauce. And he tried to throw it out the window <laughs> and the wind caught it and blew it back in the back seat all over me and all over Bobby's white interior of his car. <laughs> right? And it looked like I'd been machine gunned. My brains had been blown out. And of course, it, we're still fucking, it's two o'clock in the morning. We're still however far from home. Bobby, the next day, by the time that he had let the the heat set set in on it, had to get in there and clean all that barbecue sauce. He said he made him puke cleaning up the hot barbecue sauce. And another time, we had the Colonel Sanders gravy. And we finished with dumping the dunking the the old Colonel Sanders nuggets in the gravy. I tried to throw my gravy out so we wouldn't spill it in the car, and the wind blew it back in on the steering wheel. And Bobby had just had Taryn, his second baby. And Stan is Stan is I'm sitting there with the shit in front of me, right, and all over the steering wheel. And Bobby's looking at it, and Stan from the back seat says, "Bobby, that looks like baby shit." He started puking at the KFC gravy because it had been likened to baby shit. Anyway, go ahead. What were you going to say? What I was going to say is he had a reputation you would hear from guys in WCW. He always had a bag with everything you could ever need. <laughs> was that the case early on? When did that start that he always had so much stuff with him to the point where if anyone in the locker room needed a towel, a piece of gum, whatever it was, he was always ready. 
Well, he always had big bags and he was always prepared. Um, it, 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 as we started going on the road and being gone more, cause like in the Memphis territory, I, and, and another one was Jimmy Hart. Jimmy Hart would come into the towns and this is when you weren't even staying in a hotel. You're just driving from home and then going back. Jimmy would come in with two bags, three hats on top of his head, holding two canes. Bobby would have a couple of large size duffel bags anyway. But when we started going on the road and being gone, you know, more, more days in a row, it just got ridiculous where he was carrying body bags around and he would pick up, if you know, extra hotel towels and and or washcloths but he'd always have a sewing kit because he might need to to you know mend his tights and well he'd have extra thread in case somebody else needed something well then we're doing so much fucking eating on the road and and drive-throughs and everything he's got some cutlery you got and, and maybe a salt and pepper shaker we got from wendy's so he's got the salt and pepper he's got some cutlery he's got some napkins with we'll, it just it started growing to the point with socks. Everybody always needs some socks. Here you need some icy hot. You know, it, he was a convenience store, and it just it just started that way. And by, by the time that it was you know it was over with, everybody knew Bobby. What he as the Steiners used to go up and ask him for weird shit just to see how close he could get to it. But that was you know, and he was always happy. And he'd sew your tights for you if he had time before his match. Um, when did he become such good friends with Arn? Well, uh, when we went to, um, to work for Crockett, it ended up, and I don't know whether this was by design, but I mean, at Arn, um, he, he was an easy guy to like also the life of the locker room and, the, you know, great jokes and promos and et cetera. Uh, but it ended up that Arn and Bobby, lived in we lived in pineville louisiana i lived of god i can't even remember what's what the street was at this point but i was down about a half a mile and and to the right two blocks from bobby and arn was down the hill and down the street from bobby's house and they lived there next to each other for years and years so and just being on the road together all the time they just naturally gravitated both of them southern guys and so they, you know, they were close friends for a long time. And that's what, you know, that's what made that uh, aborted angle we had with Tully and Arn even more attractive is we could talk about real shit in it. And, you know, friends have split up and there's jealousy and et cetera. But I, I mean, it, it, I don't know anybody that wasn't friendly to Bobby except Jim Hurd and George Scott. We're the only two, I believe, that ever in history. But, but you know that was that was the thing is that with Bobby's work, everybody wanted to be in the ring with him, not only because he was a nice guy, but because he made them look so good and it was so easy, and they didn't have to worry about getting hurt, and you could have fun. I've told you about him working with Barry Windham, them having the, the doing the matches on their knees. And that just came up as something at a show one night, just to keep their their minds occupied. Because, well, Barry Windham in 1987 was, if he wasn't the best babyface in ring wrestler in the business, he was close, right? And when we worked with him and Ronnie Garvin, the U.S. Tag Team Title matches, I remember I think it was the first time they did this was in Fayetteville. And it just happened that Bobby was taking one of those off balance tackles or things. And he went back and hit the second rope instead of the top rope. His, uh, his, his right arm was over the second rope and his ass was really bounced off the mat. And, but he hit the ropes like you're coming back and ended up him and Wyndham were on their knees doing spots and they did it. And the people didn't know that anything was wrong. That was the beauty. It sounds like silly bullshit, but it would be a deal like if Bobby grabbed a headlock on Barry, because Barry was, what, 6'6"? Six, six. So Barry's on his knees. Bobby's got the headlock. Barry slings Bobby off and shoves him into the ropes. Bobby hits the second rope and bounces back, but Barry hadn't had time to get up, so Barry either picked him up and gave him a scoop slam while he was still on his knees or would hip toss him or arm drag him while he was still on his knees. And then Bobby get back up, and he'd come for another hip toss or whatever. And it looked like Barry was fighting from underneath 
went and trying to get up while Bobby's taking these bumps, but they're having a match on their fucking knees just to make it a little more difficult and keep themselves occupied because the regular shit was too easy for them. And no, and the fans are popping like it's a normal fucking spots in a normal match. They don't notice the difference because they were able to work it into the fucking thing. Who was Bobby's actual favorite guy to work with or team to work with? Uh, I, he, he probably in his life, I don't think he ever said those words. My favorite so-and-so to work with or to wrestle or whatever is so, cause I mean, it, that would be, that would be knocking somebody else for one thing, but also he loved working with Ricky and Robert, obviously. He loved working with the Fantastic because they were so easy and they were so adaptable and they were so athletic and they, you know, um, there were guys that he were, it wasn't easy to work with Dusty, with Bobby's style and Dusty's style. It wasn't complimentary to have great art, but at the same time, Bobby loved working with Dusty because he knew how to do it. It was easy, you know, and, and it was the main event spot. So, you know, he never had a blow up with anybody like you. Yeah, there was never any Sonny King, Buddy Landell situation or just like somebody, I don't want to be in a ring with them fucking guys. He got, he got testy with the Freebirds that time in Boston, just cause Jimmy Garvin. And he wasn't a fan of working with Samu, Samu and Fatu, the Samoan SWAT team, because of the way that, we were being used versus the way they were being used and not in a jealous way, but in a, it was no fun because we couldn't lead the match. We couldn't have a good match. We were just getting a shit kicked out of us and the matches were not good because of George Scott and that hierarchy, but he didn't hold it against those, those guys personally. Um, but I mean, you know, Bobby, he obviously like working with flair, Wyndham, he liked one night. He told me, see it in Dallas. He said, I like working with Scott Casey. You know, because Scott was old school and liked to lay shit in in safe places and work solid and struggle and shit to some of the things that he didn't get to do when he was getting to do the the high spot matches with Ricky and Robert. Um, but he could do everything, you know, as far as have a match with anybody and do their stuff to, to you know, if if they weren't able to do anything else. When was the first time Bobby was frustrated with Crockett Promotions or if it's after Crockett promotions was sold. Oh, well, I mean, we were frustrated at, at the checks that we were getting in early 1988, just because business was down, but he wasn't it, like wanting to leave or anything. And, mad and that's Crockett when you renegotiated. Just, that's when we renegotiated. And then he was happy until, until here came, you know, Turner broadcasting and here came Jim Hurd and here came George Scott. And even then, I don't think he ever had to pass five words with Jim Hurd. And he tried to with George Scott, and George Scott wouldn't speak to him. So he was happy that we were leaving when we were because that first time in early 89 because he thought that, like we all did, that George Scott would be out and we would come back, which is and that's what happened. But then it was just... He was the last one to show frustration, but even he was grumpy all of 1990. You know, whenever the rotating booking committees, just when we thought we had something going with, you know, with Flair, then he's, he quit. And I, and I quit shortly after because he quit the booking committee and then multiple hierarchies and you can't win a match on TV and we could never be featured. But every time we are, you know, we're still tearing the house down. It was frustrating. And of course, before you officially gave up on the booking there, the plan was for Bobby and Stan to join the Horsemen. Yeah, and I mean that uh, we got as far as as I've been reminded when they tweeted the first the first interview that we did to lead in that direction, and Flair had woman Nancy with him also, and et cetera, and we were leading in that direction, and that got cut off. It was just like I, you know, <sighs> Bobby never complained hardly about anything, but you could just see frustration, and also we'd we'd make jokes about it. You know, like <laughs> the corn, go see how many jobs we're going to do tonight at the TV taping or whatever, you know, but, uh, but he just, he, he loved wrestling and he was always happy to be in the business. And even when things weren't working out, he could have fun with it. He had fun being around the boys. That was, I think that's been the biggest problem of the last, you know, 20 years of his life or whatever is that. 
you know, that's what he did from the time he was a teenager. He went to the towns, he sat with the boys, he had fun, he laughed, he went out, and he was the best in the world at what he did naturally without, you know, I mean, he had verbal training more than he had physical training, but he was just a, a natural and got it and could do it. And that's why, you know, a lot of people said Bobby should have been a, a, a trainer and they did try him in developmental. And I think he had issues with transitioning anywhere, anything that disrupted his schedule he had you know not schedule but his his routine it threw him for a loop when stan and i left he told me you know years later that he he didn't feel right because he had gotten in that groove and he didn't feel right after that even though he liked everybody he was working with it just was different and and with training in develop you could learn a lot from sitting in the locker room with bobby and he, by asking him questions or him just saying things, or you could learn by watching him, but he couldn't, he was not a person that was going to get in there and instruct you up one side and down the other, because sometimes how does, you know, oh, let me go get Albert Einstein to teach me how to be smart. You kind of got, it, it's just, it, he did it. You, I, I always told guys, I said, and a lot more, you can get a lot more out of, watching Bobby and seeing what he does than maybe asking him how to do it or why he did it because he doesn't really know. He just does it instinctually. And what the first time he was in OVW training in developmental, and this was over 20 years ago, I, I asked him, I said, we had a crash pad. I didn't want to hurt you. So I said, Bobby, with the crash pad, can you show these guys how to do the knee? And he's, I think I can, you know, cause he was having problems bending one of his knees at that point, but he got up there, but he, he came off, but he realized he had never paid attention to how he did the knee to tell somebody, well, when you push off, you know, your left knee, he called it his heavy knee, but your left knee is going to go a little bit to the side and it's going to land, but this is going to go there. But if you tuck the shoulder, all the shit that I figured out in slow motion by watching him do it. He he just started doing the knee off the top one day and people reacted to it. So he kept doing it. It's not like he ever sat there and thought, how do I do this to be able to explain it to somebody else? So 1990, the end of the year, you and Stan finally have had enough of Heard and Ole Anderson, let's be honest. <laughs> yeah. And you guys leave, even though you're still under contract until I think May. Yeah. Bobby stays. We've talked about in the past, how at the time the plans were certainly for a Midnight Express reunion come May, but well, Dusty we had, we, came we back. Had, yeah, we had the conference before me and Stan left in the hallway at center stage because we told him we said we can't take it anymore. Well, I said I can't take it anymore. I'm fucking done because I'd call, I'd ask Stan. I said, Stan, give me your car keys. We had his car. I said, I, Why? I need to get my bag. I'm fucking going home. Well, fuck. Hold on. I'll go with you. But then we turn around and look at Bobby and Bobby's kind of like, uh, cause we had six figure contracts and Bobby had three kids and was married. Stan was not married. I was married. I was, didn't have any kids and honestly saved a little bit more money at that point and knew I had something going on and was going to figure the midnight in on it with Smoky Mountain wrestling and the preliminary talks with Ruben and et cetera. But we said, uh, Bobby stay and get your money. They at least they can't beat the Midnight Express anymore, and it's it's six months, right? Because we assumed since Herd wasn't going anywhere that we knew of, and nothing was going to change, that they just released Bobby in six months. And as you said, that's when Dusty came back in, and then it ended up they didn't release Bobby until 2000, which was fucking ten years later. Um, but originally, yes, the top heel team in Smoky Mountain Wrestling was going to be the Midnight Express. And then also to, that's where the talk of Japan came in because I, they could have gone to Japan and got, you know, Fantastics kind of, the Fantastics were on four or five grand a week with Baba at that point. We'd had a bunch of television. So I thought that it would be feasible for the Midnight to work Smoky Mountain and do japan and in until we saw what was going on with this crazy business because all the territories were folding up but 
it didn't it didn't work that way and then you know japan never came up for stan and tom because stan wouldn't really at that point as you know uh he was like i i think i'm gonna transition and got into boat racing but originally that's what it would have been if all things had had gone as we thought they might and of course in 92 bobby actually had a pretty fun year because he teamed up with arn anderson he was a part of the dangerous alliance which was just a great crew Heyman with medusa Rick Rude, Steve Austin, Larry Zabisco, Arn Anderson, and Bobby. But then like, after 1993, and I know there are fans of the Blue Bloods, and maybe because I liked Bobby so much before that, it was hard for me to accept the Blue Bloods of him and William Regal or Stephen Regal. And I like Stephen yeah. Regal, but it was just, it was a gimmick on Bobby. And and really, they, and, and Regal loved it. Regal came to the show that, uh, in Knoxville to honor Bobby. Um, Regal loved it. Bobby liked it too. Bobby liked Regal, but Regal got a huge kick out of Bobby. And that was, you know, that, that's the thing is that they, they tried to find other things to do with him. And because, and he, it was great in the dangerous Alliance and et cetera. But then toward that period of time where Bischoff and, and the idea was to poach all the WC or WWE guys, WWF then, and Hogan comes in and they're changing the style. They're trying to compete with Vince and with kind of the same product. It, 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 it Bobby had meant so much to the previous ad, administrations because he was that link to when the reason why TBS bought the company to begin with, because it was a hugely popular wrestling company. And then they'd proceeded to tank it over the previous few years. And then a bunch of new people came in and the boys still had respect. Well, remember, Goldberg, they were at Huntsville one night, and this Goldberg told the story, and somebody brought it up on the drive-thru not long ago. The Goldberg suggested, why don't we let Bobby Eaton in the streak here in Huntsville? Because everybody, all the boys loved him, but management had moved on, and it was a whole different product, and it was it was just too long. There was Bobby would have never fit at all in the WWE. Not only the he wouldn't have. He wouldn't like the the road schedule and the and the the towns were more up up north and unfamiliar and foreboding. But also the 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 culture in the locker room where everybody had little groups that was so pronounced. It would just and and that the hard rings up until ninety seven, and then the the temper tantrums and political ploys and the. All that other stuff, it wouldn't have been the rest fun wrestling business to Bobby Eaton. I don't even think the last few years of WCW was the fun wrestling business to Bobby Eaton. Two of the um, coolest things he did after 1992, though, were outside of WCW. In 93, we got to see him once again with you and Stan and with Tom Pritchard, and including that legendary match at the Bluegrass Brawl, which is one of the classic Smoky Mountain wrestling matches ever. And... In ECW in 94, the surprise appearance, which was really cool because that Philly crowd always loved the Midnight Express. Yeah. And for one last time, I mean, did a couple dates there, but especially that surprise first appearance, they got to see beautiful Bobby. Not WCW's beautiful Bobby, but Philadelphia's beautiful Bobby. Yeah. And they exploded for him. Well, and that was, um, obviously, he got the ECW spot because Paul E. sued him and got him and Arn Anderson in a settlement. Um, I got him and Arn Anderson. Funny how, you know, everybody that wanted WCW talent wanted Bobby Eaton and Arn Anderson. Um, because Watts was there and that's where we had started the, the exchange and the, the super brawl thing. And we, you know, et cetera, the way it came about was that Watts had seen that they had been using Bobby in different ways and they wanted to repackage him. He wanted to leave him off television for a few months and then bring him back because Bo obviously Bill Watts wants to use Bobby Eaton, but he felt that he'd been devalued the way he'd been presented. So he said, how about I've sent him up to you for uh, the next few months? You know, you can use him on your TV. They were still paying him, as I understand, on his contract. And th but then we'll bring him in and, and, you know, put a fresh coat of paint on him and present him in a more positive fashion. And then... I'd asked and got the dates, asked for and got the dates on Arn because that was a perfect, you know, way to complete the Rock and Roll Express team. If I've got three heavenly bodies, Stan Lane, Tom Pritchard, and 
Bobby Eaton, then if I get three members of the Rock and Roll Express and it's Arn Anderson, Arn not only knows the business and would understand how to have this match, but is close friends with Bobby. And so they cleared me for those, what, uh, three or four dates on Arn that we got. And that was going to be the start of similar shit where Watts would send guys that he wanted to give a new look to. He'd send them to me for a few months, or I would be sure to funnel my promising young talent to him. And it's the same thing we ended up doing with the WWE. We just didn't get a chance to do it with WCW because they fucked Watts and I wasn't going to deal with anybody else. But that was, and then Bobby apologized to me for that, uh, that run. He was there. What was it? Eight weeks, 10 weeks. But he said corn because he had been real sick with the flu or something right before he came in and he'd still had a problem with his breathing and he said, Corn, I don't really, I didn't hardly get my win back until the last couple of weeks I was there. I don't think I did a good enough job for him. Like, Bobby, as long as you showed up, you did a great enough job for me. Let's fast forward, if you don't mind. I'd like to know what it was like for the Midnight Express reunion shows that you started doing in what, 2003, 2004? 2004. 2004. 2004. Two, two weeks after Bubba passed away was our first one. Because that's what upset me then was that you know, we would have got a chance to be all together, but, um, well, it, here's the thing and trying to go back and do this as uh, clearly and concisely as possible. Dennis left in March of 1987. Nobody ever knew why, including me and Bobby for a long time. As a result, there was never heat amongst the team. There was consternation, befuddlement. Where the fuck did Dennis go? And then there was some element of how could he have done this? Because we're still, and, and you know, a main event fucking earning six figures plus each <clears throat> attraction. And suddenly we turn around and he just ain't there. And we don't see him for a year and a half. So, but there was no heat, there was no fight, there was no, you know, disagreements or whatever. So we soldiered on with Stan and Stan fit right in because we'd all known each other again and he was smart to tag team wrestling and it fit and he was in need of a spot then. So he was anxious to prove himself because that was, it was going to end up being his fairly, fairly much his last big run there because normally... The Fabs was a pretty big run, and you would have thought that would have been the one you get, but he got a second one even bigger. But anyway, um, when Dennis came back at the, to do the original Midnight Midnight Angle, as we mentioned, he, he showed back up in the AWA back in the wrestling business because when he left us for a year, he was nowhere. We didn't know where he was, and then... All that we knew was the travel agent found that he had some tickets that Crockett had already given him for the towns he's booked in, and he changed them for a ticket to Denver, Colorado. So that's all we knew for a long time was that Dennis is in Denver some kind of way. Well, then the AWA had started. They needed talent. They were on their dying days. They were doing the TV in Las Vegas as close to Denver, and they needed quality guys, so they made a deal with Dennis to come back and work with Randy Rose and Paul Lee as the original Midnight, and they had the run on TV as the AWA Tag Team Champions. We still didn't have a phone number or anything on Dennis, and, you know, we didn't know at the time, so we're not, well, not going to fucking find him. But then when, you know, the AWA was... It, but the the original Midnight, I can't remember now chapter and verse, but the original Midnight was finished with the AWA, even if the AWA wasn't completely finished at that point. Paul Lee had called me, because of course we knew each other, and I said, well, you want to fucking come in if we can work it out? And so that's when I went and pitched the angle to Dusty, um, have them come in, let's do the feud over the name, hit me with the phone. Uh, I've told this story before. Dusty asked me and Bobby he didn't ask Stan because Stan it wouldn't have had a vested interest in this. He said, I won't bring Dennis Condry back unless you and Bobby say yes, because he left before I said, no, this is, this is good. We've, we've talked, uh, I've talked to Paul Lee. They're all on board. 
And the first time that me and Bobby actually saw Dennis, that time was when he got to Atlanta TV that day. And he still didn't explain to us what had gone on because there was kind of a little cold. But then we did the angle and everybody went crazy over it and blah, blah, blah. We didn't know it was going to be fucked up shortly afterwards. But anyway, that lasted, as we've talked about, 10 or 12 weeks or whatever it was. And then <laughs> Dusty loses the book. Crockett gets it, books us a loser leave town match because he doesn't like Randy Rose's work, wants to get Dennis a new partner. George Scott comes in, says he'd rather keep the original Midnight and get rid of me and fucking Bobby and Stan. It was a goddamn clusterfuck. And then because Dennis didn't, agree to come in for a different partner because Crockett didn't realize that the whole deal was that Randy and Dennis were the original Midnight Express. It fucked the whole thing up and Dennis no-showed again. And we didn't say that was 1989 and we didn't see him again until 2004. And then he had made an appearance uh, at, at one of the wrestling shows in Birmingham and gave his phone number to several people and he was in the process of moving back from Denver to... Alabama, and that's when uh, we were we got his number, and I called. We all everybody called and talked to each other, and that's when he was able to tell me and Bobby what it was, and and I'm not going to say that now what it was. It was nothing to do with the wrestling business, and it was nothing to do with us. And we would have understood if he'd told us, and that he said that was his one regret that he didn't. So then we started doing the reunions, and the first one was in Kingsport, Tennessee, at the, at the old Civic Auditorium up there, Ron Wright Country, um, a match with the Rock and Roll Express. And then the following week, uh, that was just Bobby and Dennis and I, and then the following week, it was all four of us with Stan at Ring of Honor in Philly for that big return, and then with the fan fests and legend shows and etc for several years i wasn't at at most of them because i was i was doing ovw and then i went to tna but i was at a lot of the bigger ones especially the fan fest but bobby and dennis especially wrestled quite on quite a few shows and and drew some money into carol i think they did a show in the carolinas with the rock and roll in lenore well they did i know they did three or four sellouts at that lenore rec center two thousand people uh, three or four sellouts in a row, but I think most of those matches were with the Rock and Roll Express. They were, uh, they were doing good business at that point. But you know, Dennis was in better shape than most everybody else because he took a significant chunk of time off. So, but anyway, that you know, that was the that was more fun because we used to joke about it. We used to say, Jesus Christ these fan fests, everybody's so happy to see us and so happy to get their pictures taken. And we make the same thing. We used to have to drive a 500 mile round trip, take bumps, get beat up and potentially stabbed or jumped on by fans and, uh, you know, have our cars trashed. Then <laughs> the fans at Alexandria, Louisiana found out after the, the uh, tape aired where we tarred and feathered, magnum ta on television in order to shame them into giving us a shot of the titles calling him a chicken the fans recognized bobby's car outside the hotel we were staying at in alexandria the week after that tv show played and they tarred and feathered his car but anyway uh so we used to get oh in lake charles they took dennis condry's van that he bought from stan lane and almost doomed us all in lake charles they took uh glue and shot it in all the door keyholes back when your door <laughs> still had keyholes and they took lipstick and they would color over the the headlights so that you couldn't see out on the highway and that's the place where they used to put uh drano and water pistols to be able to because the cops were so good they had the heels surrounded so they would try to shoot you in the eyes with the drano with the water pistol they were creative but yeah bobby uh uh, he took forever to get the tarred feathers off his car at Alexandria and Dennis had to have, I can't remember what he had to have done to get the, uh, glue out of the keyholes. We all had to get key locking gas tank lids to, uh, custom on our cars because people would sugar the fucking tank. Jim, I had a question for you, but before I get to that, I just want to let the listeners know, let the people who are on the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel know that we're going to be doing a compilation of some of the great 
stories you've told in the past about Bobby. We're compiling them, and over the next several days, we hope to have an omnibus of Bobby Eaton stories up on the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. So be on the lookout for that. And and that and that that's kind of tough because of, so many of them are sprinkled in and other conversations but we've you know we've got some good stuff out there and i don't know whether i've told some of these again today or whether the but we wanted to find some to get as much out there as we could so there you go what was your question well i was going to ask you because we've seen a lot of active wrestlers talk about bobby since his passing and there are a lot of younger wrestlers out there who may have never worked with bobby probably never saw him live Everything you watch with him, you could learn something. But are there any specific matches or things in matches that you think wrestlers could learn from that they should be learning from? I think if 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 you're a professional wrestler and you want to study Bobby Eaton, there's different eras and different different versions of the Midnight Express. In Louisiana, we were it was an old fashioned heat territory where we were heels on top expected to fucking draw and to have heat and to get the baby faces over. And it was personal issues and angles and a lot more, you know, just wildness in the matches. And you can really see the young Bobby Eaton. If you go back and like I said, the, the matches with the rock and roll express, a lot of the Houston stuff is still out there because Paul taped his house shows, Paul Bosch. Um, I, I know there's some stuff with uh, Magnum and wrestling Two on YouTube, but watch, I won't say everything that it, it, I mean, there was some stuff even in mid South in 84 there uh, I've watched one match we had with brick house Brown and George Wells. And I was like, Oh my God. Um, go find a sunny King match. Well, yeah, thankfully we did only in the Superdome did we cross <laughs> paths with Sonny, and I liked Sonny as a person, but, um, but uh, Magnum TA and wrestling Two, watch the crowd react to what Bobby's doing. The rock and roll express, not only watch Bobby's work with both Ricky and Robert, but how the crowd reacted to him. Then in, in Crockett, it depends on if you, it, do you want to watch, you know, it's not as beautiful and technically perfect tag team matches, but that match with the road warriors from Raleigh, that was on television with baby doll punches me in the back of the head, the finish that one. But it, it shows Bobby working with guys like Hawk and animal that did absolutely nothing related to his style, but he fit what he did to them. Um, obviously anything in Crockett with the rock and roll express, but also the Southern boys, great American bash. If you want to see how to put a tag team match together, that's not a grudge match and it's not a bloody fight. It's just to get people excited in an arena that Southern boys match was tremendous. All the matches with the fantastics um, and Brian Pillman and zinc for that matter. Uh, Brian Pillman, the only other guy I was with flair when he was Booker and I was on his team for six months. And the only two guys he specifically wanted to have singles matches with that he asked for were Bobby Eaton and Brian Pillman. So not only Watch the way Bobby did things, but watch the way the people reacted to it because of the way he reacted to what the other guys did. Not just selling, but selling it. The, the, uh, the, the definition of selling something is you make somebody else buy it. The people bought what was going on because he, was, he made it his own and got it over. Um, so any of those matches, and... You know, I mean, there's there's so much out there, but obviously I wouldn't, I know most of the younger generation, if they saw the Midnight and Rock and Roll in person at all, saw the reunion matches. And I'm not going to say those were bad matches because the people in every venue enjoyed seeing it. But what you were getting was, you know, a, a Legends match and not all of those guys in their in their prime when they shocked everybody with what was going on. But, uh, you know, that's, the, that's the thing is they could adapt. Not only the, the rock and roll are still going cause they, they adapted to what they could do rather than, you know, uh, trying to do things they couldn't do anymore. And it's, so it still worked. And with Ricky's he's, he's insane, but, uh, but I would suggest matches like those if you wanted to, uh, especially all the pay-per-view stuff is out there, thankfully you know, from WCW, but, uh, some of the house show matches 
and some of the the uh, stuff that was only VHS taped or whatever, or the you know the stray things that you find out there that weren't ever released, like the Houston stuff in their entirety. That's some of the best indication of Bobby Eaton because whether he was on pay per view or whether he was in Fayetteville at the Cumberland County Memorial Arena, uh, he worked the same way in large part because he was a professional. It just, I've told you the story before. I know I've told you this from the time that we were after we went to, after we were in Louisiana, right? When we got to Crockett was really when I started doing this a lot, but we started a little bit in Louisiana. As soon as they'd start the match, Bobby would get in the ring and he'd lock up with somebody and he'd grab a hold and he would look at me. If I was leaning on my right hand, my chin on my right hand, I'd have like three fingers up on the, I meant we were getting a $300 payoff. And he might crank up on the headlock and call one tackle, drop down, hip toss, get it again. But if I've got all five fingers up, he's going to call, uh-oh, one tackle, drop down, hip toss, knee lift, over the top rope. <laughs> and if I'm leaning on my left hand and I've got a one finger up, that means a grand, and then he's taking every bump in sight. But he always gave everybody his his best effort. He was just judicious sometimes with how badly he was going to destroy himself. Did he ever mess up the Alabama Jam? You know, there, there was, as a matter of fact, there was one. I'll tell you where it was. It was the, it was the match with Flair and Wyndham at the Clash of Champions, where if you notice, when he does the Alabama Jam, he doesn't get any height, and he kind of does a double thumbs up kind of maneuver as he's coming off. That's because he had a crossed rib that night. He thought it was broken, but it was crossed. You know, when your rib gets crossed, it Ooh. fucking feels like a broke rib, right? He'd been working with a crossed rib for like a week or two at that. <laughs> so, so he didn't get the height on that one, but mess one up, mess anything up. I mean, there were missed spots sometimes, but anything he did off the top rope, he never heard anybody any time that I was ever in his presence, and it usually looked good. I don't recall him ever really messing anything off the top rope up. Uh, every once in a while, a spot's going to go awry. He missed the third arm drag or whatever. But, um, well, it, the the match, and I'll tell you, here's, and this, I think it was Dax. It may have been Cash, too, but both of them tweeted out that their favorite midnight match was, because they're tag team specialists, and this was a, as far as a tag team match goes, this was probably better than anything with the rock and roll from a pure technical standpoint. Rock and roll just brought so much emotion from the people. But the one hour that we did on Worldwide Wrestling, the U.S. tag team title match where they beat us in Chattanooga, it was the whole hour. It was a 40-something minute match, but it went the whole hour of the syndicated TV show. All day... Uh, that day was when I believe, yeah, that was the match. Bobby was, he had 102 degree fever and he'd been puking in the locker room already at the building, much less being sick before we got there. And that's the big time where Dusty is because Dusty would only do the one match goes the whole show with people that he not only trusted to do it, but people that were really figured in, he wanted to get something over. Nobody got that much time on TV in those days, except Ric Flair or the Midnight Express. So he wasn't going to fucking say, no, can we do it in 20 minutes? So he went out there after he had been puking and had a fever and had, what was it, voted the third best match of the year in three different bulletins or whatever the fuck. And it's still the favorite match of tag teams today. But that's just because he wasn't going to fucking let anybody down. And he never did. And anyone who saw the Midnight Express or Bobby Eaton wrestle, it's always a memorable experience. And I only got to see Bobby live once. And it was memorable because it was Philadelphia, an awful show, Halloween Havoc 92. And the opening match was the baby faced this poor team. Tom Zink, Shane Douglas, and Johnny Gunn, Tom Brandy. Oh, who that Philadelphia crowd just loathed. And then out to Bad Street, USA, Michael Hayes, Arn and Bobby. And it was like, a, you know, other than Hayes, who people like because he was the Freebirds, but Arn and Bobby had that Philadelphia history. It was like a homecoming. It was the place went nuts for Arn and Bobby and Hayes. You know, I, th I think that's <sighs> the last 20 years or however long it's been. And I mean, Bobby's been going and he's been 
doing independent shows. He obviously hasn't been able to wrestle for the last several years, but he'd make appearances, do fan fests. He's done seminars. And I just think that I wish that he could have had something to transition into. I think he lost something when he couldn't wrestle anymore that he couldn't, he couldn't get back in his life. I mean, he loved his grandkids. And he loved his kids and he's, he was, you know, you'd always see him happy. One of the younger guys mentioned, Hey, I saw this legend, Bobby Eaton, a few years ago, come into this podunk town. And it was just like, he was happy as to be there as he was happy to be anywhere in his whole life. It's because he was, he was in the locker room and he came to a wrestling show. And I mean, I'm not going to tell you that he didn't either laugh or roll his eyes at all the things that's going on with wrestling. Bobby never really knocked anybody, but he, you know, it wasn't the business he got in. He wasn't the business that he grew up on or whatever, but he was, he just wanted to be a part of wrestling and be that, you know, when you do that from the time he was 16, like I said, you go to the locker room, you hang out with the boys, you have fun and you go out and you be the best in the world at what you do. It it just hadn't been the same on him, and I don't think he had anything else in his life to transition to on a professional basis or a, otherwise in his family that that you know he either had the aptitude for the or the interest in or just the you know it just it, it seems like when somebody is that far ahead of almost everybody else at one thing that they do sometimes you know it's a shortcoming that they don't have. Uh, something else to fall back on. Um, but I think he's missed that because still, you know, you, if like, he, I've got messages where he, I've still got him on my voicemail and, and I won't erase him where he would call me. If, he wouldn't call me and say, Corny, it's Bobby. He'd call me and say, Jim Cornette is Sterling Brewer. Who was the announcer for the Birmingham TV in the seventies that nobody in the world, but me and him still remembers. Or he, if he'd call it Courtney, how big's George Hultz? I'd say six, six, two seventy six, Cause that's the way the big George Hultz was announced in 1974 in Birmingham or whatever. Um, and he was the first, was he the first person to call you corny? Yes. <laughs> corny <laughs> or corn. And then Stan, uh, elongated it to Cornelius J. Cornett. Uh, but yeah, corn, Hey corn. Uh, but yeah, you know, he, he, he would just call you on the phone and just, it would be something that would pop me and him, but nobody else would get it. But that's what he did in, in his time at home these days, or, you know, before he was, had his grandkids around, that was the happiest he'd get. He'd be sitting with a, some, you know, bubble gum and a, a bottle of pop and watching wrestling on TV, whether it's old wrestling or new wrestling, whether it's something with a ring. And, but anyway, I was, I talked to him Saturday afternoon and he sounded like himself. I talked to him the previous, what was it, Wednesday, and he obviously was not happy about being in the hospital and didn't seem to feel too good. But Saturday he was perky and he sounded like Bob. And I was trying to pump him up a little bit because, you know, with Donna just going and being in turmoil, and I think that had a lot to do with it. Probably is his routine, his schedule got all upended. People coming and going and, and, you know, Bobby never let anything get on him or never bother him outwardly. I mean, one time I'll, I'll back this up and I'll come back to the, talk on Saturday and second, but when he was living in Charlotte in Pineville down the street from Arn and me, I went over there one day and this, when he had all three kids, I think I was setting up Smoky mountain, but I hadn't moved to Tennessee yet. And I pull up out in front of his house and he, oh, he had a couch and, and an easy chair on his front porch. So he could sit out on a front porch when he was home. Right. And he, they had a couple cars in a driveway and I guess there's, Dylan, what well, Dustin, his oldest, was on a skateboard, and Donna had Elvis music playing and a speaker in the window, and Taryn was playing with some of the neighborhood kids, and and Dylan, the little one, was something else was going on, and, and there was some dogs running around. 
it was like the center of activity in the whole neighborhood. And I said, and he's just sitting there drinking his beer. I said, Bobby, when do the dancing bears show up? What the fuck's going on here? It's a goddamn concert and a garden party. It just, and it, but he's just sitting, you know, having a good time. But so Saturday, I was trying to, you know, uh, pep you up a little bit, getting out of the hospital, take care of yourself and take your medicine because I was going to talk about this later on and I will talk about it later on another time. We were making plans for some stuff for the Midnight Express's 40th anniversary, which is going to be 2023 and was going to be 2023, 2024. And we did the book for the 25th anniversary and we did a live tour of some shows for 35th. And this time we'd uh, been putting together a merchandise deal and some cool one of a kind shit and stuff. that hadn't been done before. And, and there may still be a way we can do that and benefit Bobby's kids, or grandkids or whatever, but anyway, and explaining to him that, Hey, we're going to, you know, this cameo thing as uh, I'd mentioned to, we were going to, maybe think about doing some cameos with all four of us. Um, if we got together to do a signing thing, we were talking about doing, anyway, I was giving him, the point is, you know, he was excited about that. He still had some stuff. Obviously if he's, the was the kind of guy where uh, Bobby people all over the world love you. Oh, come on corn. No, but you know, shh. and I wanted to let him know people still remembered and had, you know, these feelings for him. And anyway, so he seemed excited about all that. And, and that's when I got a chance to tell him, thank you for everything that he had done for me. And I said that, you know, we would be getting together in a month or two and, and doing this other shit and just take care of himself. And that's at least that's the last time I got to talk to him and it was all positive and he was in a good mood. And Brian Thompson had taken him from the hospital home and said that he talked about it a couple of different times. Wow, it was a good call. You know, we're going to have some things happening or whatever. And I just hope that, you know, he kept that, you know, that in his mind and kept that, that mood going. Um, I love you, Bobby Lee, and I always will. Thank you for everything. <laughs>